According to Rudolf Steiner himself, his life was divided into two periods. The first period as a respected scholar. The second period as a mad occultist. Dancing fear F. Riddlemeyer asked Rudolf Steiner why he never touched upon occult topics before his 40th year. Steiner replied, I first had to attain a certain position in the world. People could say of my present occult writings that they are mad. Then, however, there are my earlier works which cannot be ignored. Steiner hoped his earlier reputation as a respected scholar would assure people his later occult work was not the wild speculations of a madman. In the first period of his life, up to 1900, Dr. Steiner built a reputation that reached beyond Germany as a respected scholar of science and philosophy, and as a cultural personality who wrote articles expressing his social and political views. In the second period of Steiner's life, after 1900, his works are based on knowledge gained from special clairvoyant faculties. His occult research forms the basis of today's anthroposophy. This is when he began lecturing on occult topics such as Eastern spiritualism, occult mysteries, esoteric training, spiritual beings, Christology, lost Atlantis, reincarnation, karma, and astrology. It is not a surprise that Steiner's clairvoyant form of research led skeptics from the science community to label anthroposophy a pseudoscience. Anthroposophy is a philosophy which holds that the spirit world can be scientifically investigated. You don't find the skeptics criticizing Rudolf Steiner's work in his scholar period. This is why it is so important for people to learn about the first period of his life. The brilliance of his scientific research into human nature should first be recognized and appreciated for its significant contribution to the science of human freedom. During his scholar period, Steiner was trained in science and became respected as a well-published scientific, literary, and philosophical scholar. From 1879 to 1883, he attended the Vienna Institute of Technology. In 1882 to 1897, he was the editor of the scientific works of Goethe. In 86, he worked on the complete edition of Goethe's writings. In 88, he was the editor of the weekly German magazine. From 90 to 97, he worked in the Schiller-Goethe archives. In 1891, he was awarded a doctorate in philosophy. In 94, he met with Heckel and began a correspondence. From 97 to 1900, he was the editor of his own magazine called The Magazine for Literature. From 99 to 04, he was instructor at the Berlin Workers' School. The basic books of the scholar period were, in 1883, Goethean Science, in 86, Science of Knowing, in 92, Truth and Science, and in 1894, The Philosophy of Freedom. He also published many science, social, and political articles, which he said were imbued with the spirit of the philosophy of freedom in his literature magazine from 97 to 1900. During his scholar period, Rudolf Steiner's work was based on his observation of human nature, especially the processes of cognition. What he discovered was the free spirit. He called it the purest expression of human nature. It was in this period that Rudolf Steiner struggled to reach the mountain peak and become a free individuality. He described his successful journey to free thinking and free action in the philosophy of freedom. Steiner's greatest accomplishment and most important work, his magnum opus, was the philosophy of freedom. When asked which of his books he would most want rescued if some catastrophe should strike, Steiner always unhesitantly named the philosophy of freedom. What some consider to be Steiner's mad period begins in 1900, when he disappointed his friends by joining with the Theosophists and began to speak of his clairvoyant perceptions of the spiritual world. His friends were confused, for Steiner had shown no respect for spiritualists and theosophists in his literary magazine. In an article he wrote for his magazine, Steiner said the spiritualists and theosophists waged war on science. The theosophists and the spiritualists form an alliance to help them wage war on the straightforward science of the modern era, which is solely supported by reason and observation. 
He described the theosophists as esoteric gossips who preferred vague spiritualism over conceptual clarity. The theosophists would rather indulge in esoteric gossip about their experience of the divine within than to acknowledge the clear, transparent conceptual knowledge of the West. Steiner mocked their claims of experiencing the divinity within. The theosophist says, intellectuals circle around the thing, merely inspecting its surface. We, however, live inside the object. Yes, we experience the divinity within us. You will hardly ever escape from them branding you a narrow-minded intellectual. Steiner attributed the rapid growth of the Theosophical Society at the time to be the result of spiritual seduction. Membership in the society peaked in 1927 and has declined ever since. The way they speak of the highest knowledge, which they do not possess, and the mystical way they assert incomprehensible wisdom seduces many. Consider how the Theosophical Society has spread all over Europe. Steiner's change in direction occurred when the Theosophists invited him to give a series of esoteric lectures. They were eager to hear of his clairvoyant perceptions of the spiritual world. Steiner was having clairvoyant experiences since the age of eight and now was willing to talk about it. This was an opportunity for Steiner to try and bring science to the occult. In 1902, he accepted a position to head a newly formed German section of the Theosophical Society. After some disagreements in 1913, Steiner and a group of theosophists splintered off and founded the Anthroposophical Society. Twenty-five years later, after its original publication, Steiner revised and then republished The Philosophy of Freedom in 1918. The basic books of the occult period were 1902, Christianity as Mystical Fact, 04, Theosophy, 04, How to Know Higher Worlds, and in 1910, Occult Science. In the occult period of Steiner's life, he renewed past historical paths that led to knowledge and freedom for those less interested in science. In the Philosophy of Freedom, it says, the Oriental sage requires his disciples to live a life of resignation and aestheticism for years before he shares with them his knowledge. The West no longer demands pious exercises and aesthetic practices to attain knowledge. In the first decade of the 20th century, August Uerbeck got word that there were intimate circles in which Rudolf Steiner gave special esoteric training to those admitted to them. So he asked his teacher whether he too might be allowed to attend and receive the astonishing reply, You don't need to. You have understood my philosophy of freedom. What we find is that the philosophy of freedom stands on its own, completely independent of anthroposophy and his later clairvoyant research into the spiritual realm. This book occupies a position completely independent of my writings on actual spiritual scientific matters. What I have said in the philosophy of freedom may be acceptable even to some who, for reasons of their own, refuse to have anything to do with the results of my research into the spiritual realm. Peter Norman Wegg puts it this way, History cannot show one pioneer who is worth the digesting of absolutely everything. Isaac Newton won't be remembered for his speculations about the apocalypse of St. John. Steiner is interesting because of his project to rescue the individual and its humanness from drowning in foggy spiritualism as well as in stiffened materialism. For those who are interested in anthroposophy, it is his respected scholar period that establishes Rudolf Steiner's reputation. By first gaining a respect for Steiner, a person will become more open-minded toward his later work. And for those who are not at all interested in anthroposophy, that's fine. The philosophy of freedom stands on its own, completely independent of anthroposophy. Thanks for watching.